Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Tom Nato, and uh, this is the NET podcast uh, presented by my colleagues Dave Tucker, Brent Salisbury, and Kyle Mystery. Um, this is our first podcast, so we're we're kind of playing this as ear by ear and uh, figuring it out. Uh, comments and feedback are very appreciated to make this thing better and more interested, more interesting. Um, we'll be welcoming guests in the future, but today we were going to just take a swipe at uh, a little retrospective about what, uh, where we've where we've been with SDN, where we are today, and where we're headed. Um, before we get started, uh, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Kyle, you want to go first? Yeah, definitely. So, I, uh, like Tom said, I'm Kyle Mestri. I've kind of been involved in this whole software-defined networking and open source movement, maybe. I don't know if we're calling it a movement nowadays, but maybe we are. Uh, I've kind of been involved with that for, for almost 10 years now. And, and even before that, I was working on open source. Um, I guess it really dates me to mention that I was like working on ARM support in the Linux kernel in the 90s, but that's that makes me seem old and I can't believe I'm that old now. So I don't know. Uh, Dave, how about if you go next? There we go. Yeah, that sounds really cool, Kyle. Uh, it's way more interesting than the stuff I was working on. Um, so I, I'm a network engineer by training and then switched over to software engineering around that SDN timeframe. So uh, it was exciting for me because I've always been a closet software engineer and that really gave me the opportunity to kind of throw myself in at it. So uh, that was where I met Brent. So, uh, hey, buddy, why didn't you uh, tell us who you are? Hello, friends. Uh, yeah, so Brent Salisbury, um, network engineer for about 20 years now. Um, like Kyle said, I think I think we all kind of call ourselves network engineers first because we have this ridiculous passion for networking. Um, kind of started off on the ops architecture side, you know, breaking networks, walking into enterprises where you hear over the speakers, the network's down, and go to pen and paper in the late 90s, early 2000s. SDN came around. Uh, towards the end of that decade and you know, transitioned into software. And uh, yeah, the, the madness of software defined insanity. So it's gonna be fun talking about it. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, with that in mind, let's uh, start off with kind of where we were like in the past. I mean, you guys started touching on that earlier. Like let's let's rewind back to the early days. Like, like Kyle was saying um, before it was called SDN, right? There was a bunch of interesting efforts some of us were involved in there was you know the stuff going on at stanford um it was stuff we were doing at the itf like like ward and i and and uh, a few other people um were doing it at the itf and then there was stuff going on um uh at etsy they were they were starting to do stuff over there i mean what, what were you all I, I think it's in? also you know on the open source side right we had the Linux kernel obviously was doing networking even 10 years ago. I mean, beyond that, but yeah, you started to see this evolution even there about what can we do inside the kernel in terms of performance? Can we maybe do some things outside of the kernel? What are the advantages or disadvantages of that? That exploration started to happen. And I think, I think we should also talk about and kind of call it out that in a lot of ways, I think OpenStack really helped to kind of blow the doors open on this whole SDN thing. I mean, who kind of got their start, uh, you know, using uh, Open vSwitch with with uh, Quantum at the time or, or Neutron, right? I mean, Dave's laughing, but I know he did. I know he played with that. Yeah. You used it, yeah. Well, you know, it went hand in hand too with the 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 really the blooming of open source too at the same time, right? OpenStack was kind of like a good uh, vehicle, right, for people to pile onto and build this stuff, right? Because before it was um, you know, I, I, I started working on things that you could call SDN now when I was at Cisco when way back when, when it was even, you know, we were working on doing, um, you know, different kinds of optical switching with MPLS and then using programmable control, you know, and we were kind of calling it programmability at the time. Um, but it was proprietary, so we couldn't let that out of the, out of the barn, you know, so to speak. And and the OpenStack thing really like it, it it was a real like marquee thing for you to work on and yeah like you worked on it heavily 
I get involved in it later. I don't know how how did that yeah, kind of it, come out of the it, primordial soup? Yeah, I think it did, and I think even before OpenStack. So you got to remember, in two thousand six, I joined Cisco, and and we started working on you know the Nexus one thousand V at the time, which again proprietary, but it was really the the first chance where you started to see networking get down onto the host, right? I mean, you know, Brent can attest to this. I'm sure before that, kind of everything ended at at the host, but now you're you're starting to pull things into the host that were never there before, and so you're conflating from an operations point of view the server folks, the networking folks, you know, from a sales point of view, you're conflating how do you, who do you sell to? Uh, you know, like there was a there was a delineated line, the sale, you know, like the server people sold the server people and the networking people sold the networking people. That's That's gone away. Everyone's interests were getting conflated in that. And, well, you know, what's and, interesting in there too was, was some jaded past, right? You know, I did date myself a little bit, um, but that that conflation or the, or the anti-conflation uh, group were the folks that, for example, were stung by ATM to the desktop, right? And then kind of in the middle of there, there was actually talk of MPLS to the desktop, you know, and obviously that didn't happen, thankfully. But I think you dated boomer. yourself for sure. ATM yeah. to the desktop, that's, that's <laughs> like, uh, that's mid to late 90s. Yeah, it's late 90s. Don't get, don't get crazy. <laughs> I, 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 ripped, I ripped out a lot of ATM. Does that count? <laughs> yeah, that was you doing a service to everyone, man. Well, I was, and I think, you know, so you bring up a good point with, with uh, OpenStack, because I think what, what an eye opener of OpenStack was, it's like, here's a set of APIs that are generic that I can provision network services, network functions. So it was this early functions, it was everything as a service, load balancer as a service, firewall as a service, network as a service. I mean, before that, it was just, you know, you could go to Amazon and maybe do that. But, you know, or before you know, that, programmability was SNMP or something or CLI right, thing. Remember right. the whole that whole thing around when Netcom first came out, right? And the variations of transports and whatnot. And a lot of people actually poo pooed it at the time for its verbosity. But what we found now is that doesn't it? It's it doesn't actually matter the verbosity. It's actually more important to be able to decode it and have humans understand it you know, rather than a binary encoding mess too. Mm -hmm. And that led to the, you know, a lot of the programmability that we have today, right? Well, what I think is kind of cool, and uh, I guess I was working at HP when all of this started to take off. So I'm very aware of that story of, we had a server team and they sold servers and they would sell switches inside those big blade servers, which weren't real networking switches. <laughs> they were built by a different group and they did terrible things. Uh, so you needed to have the right switches and it, it just, it got all messy. And when things like M1KV started coming out like that, that was the turning point. Um, but I, I think one of the other cool things is as well with SDN is that there were definitely two camps. There was kind of the OpenStack camp, which were trying to do more with KVM and how, how can we take, uh, you know, all of these cool networking things like load balances and instantiate software versions of them so we can scale really far. And then you had the prog programmability camp, which was all the stuff coming out from Stanford with OpenFlow, which is how can we make hardware do that? How can that's you have the point. hardware which we can turn that's around and how can we still sell boxes, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point. There are actually three important kind of inflections that happen, right? The third one we forgot to mention is is virtualization, right? The, you know, and the, you know, the, you know, where we're at containers now, but we were at virtualizing things in tin cans back then. But that virtualization also added, like like Brent was saying, like making the APIs accessible and nimble. Um, but then the things that they were controlling also had to be accessible and nimble too, right? And we still have a bit of, you know, so this is the NetOps, Net DevOps angle that, that came born out of that uh, effort as well, right? Like the problem you just described, Dave, like, I've got two different machines in the same chassis. What the hell? <laughs> like talk right. about operational fun right there, right? Yeah, it was like three different teams. Uh, you'd have uh, somebody looking after the SAN, because uh, of course we still have fiber channel based storage for forever. Then you had the team doing the network and then you had the team that were actually doing the server provisioning sure. and like never the three would meet. And that was a, a massive problem. And yeah, DevOps has helped solve some of that. Uh, but I think definitely 
Um, there was a, an impotence mismatch, right? Uh, storage seemed to move very quickly uh, because we already had network-based file systems. We had somewhere to start from and iterate from on that side. Uh, virtualization was already a thing, and we started to see you know, a lot of movement on that side as well. But networking was kind of net new in some ways. Uh, we, we were starting from scratch, uh, and, and I don't think we've really caught up yet. And, and that way, and that's what like Kyle was saying, Stack surrounded all of that and kind of put a front over it that was unifying in some ways. And then not just unified, but then allowed you to play with the virtualization and the software control. Right. Yeah, and further, I think one of the things with OpenStack that made it easy to experiment, you know, was was that whole uh, DevStack concept where you could you could literally kind of take the whole thing and deploy it quick, get an get get an entire thing running, you know, inside a VM or on a physical host, and just play around with it and experiment it. And I remember reading all kinds of blogs from Brent back in the day around this, and it was. It was just yeah. exciting because you could yeah. move so quick and you could suddenly start to, you know, experiment with these things. And I think all of that kind of helped to open the door and maybe evolve to where we are today. I mean, in a lot of ways that. Well, there were, that and there, and it did actually, cause there were, I, I'm remembering now as you're talking about this, um, uh, it, it, flipping back to the proprietary side of this and how it didn't progress. So I remember sitting downstairs looking at my, my rack of equipment one afternoon and I had, I don't know, six Mac minis in there. And I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just treat them like one computing resource of some kind and link them together? And, you know, Apple had this 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 crazy distributed computing thing they had set up, which, of course, was proprietary and et cetera. And I, I tried to use it one time. I, I just could not figure out how to get the damn thing working. And I just, ah, forget it. And I'll go back to the old way and manually flick jobs to each of the servers and get them to work um but the and when openstack came along i went like like you just said kyle you know holy cow i could just <laughs> treat them all like one thing you know um and then the software control part which is really cool because then you could create virtual networks too it's much like the server thing like i went wow i don't have to rack five switches to try this out <laughs> i'll just make a uh, you know, a virtual one and yeah, you know, make some VMs and plug them in and off you go. Um, a la mini net. So, right. A mini net, right. Mini so the, the, net. this is wow. the key thing. So as a, as a network engineer, right. Access to hardware was super important because you had to get certifications. You needed to have the hardware there. Like people studying for CCIE would have to rent a rack or have a rack in their garage to to be able to like actually get hold of all of this stuff, and it's very expensive. Now with MiniNet and with uh, tools like GNS3, we were able to like virtualize all of these network devices that you know we weren't able to do before. Everything was a VM, and it, like it was amazing. Just having that virtualization there and being able to spin this up was really what got me hooked and eventually got me into containers. Like when, when I was doing tech marketing at HP, like over a period of years, what used to be like a half rack that had to get shipped around to every conference turned into a laptop. But that <laughs> that is one of the coolest things I think SDN has managed to accomplish for us. Yeah, like the last like three ONSs my team has done, we brought a bunch of laptops. <laughs> I could do most right? of our stuff, yeah. <laughs> It's pretty pretty incredible. Um, how about changing gears a little bit to you know, or, or fast forward a little bit through OpenStack into the SDN components of OpenStack, right? And corresponding, like we were talking about OVS, you know, overlay networks then became a thing. I remember having that debate. Um, I think I was I was at BT then when this these, these concepts started to be thrown around, and you know. The, the counterpoint at the time was, well, we have MPLS VPN networks. What do we need that stuff for to virtualize, you know, overlay? Because it, and in fact, if you look back today through the lens of SD-WAN, SD-WAN is really IPsec VPN with a centralized controller, right? It's not far off from what we had, you know? Yeah. But um, the counterpoint then was, oh, we got this. What do you need that for, you know? I mean, we have to start off the conversation by blessing BGP, IP, MPLS, the holy trinity. Yes, so. yes sir. <laughs> <laughs>
the BGP dump truck. Right. It carries all. <laughs> which, which in some degree, we are reinventing the wheel with overlays and, and label switching. I'm just going to throw that out there, right? I mean, so it's if you guys remember back, you know, 20 years ago, if you had a really bad architecture to a remote site, you would nail up a GRE tunnel. Um, and now, basically, tunnels are, you know, de facto an overlay and, you know, so there's something to be said. You're, you're abstracting away these kind of inflexible or even out of your your control components. Um, well, know, that was the thing that was born out of, you know, we, we laughed at ATM just now, but the, the tag switching that came from ATM and then MPLS, well, tag switching before that, we called it tag switching and then MPLS. And that it's the same concept, right? It's a... It's a it's another layer of, of uh, addressing, uh, wrapping, you know. Well, and 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 I'm going to bring up. Uh, we we can't have this discussion without talking about MTU. I mean, we got to yes. do that for sure because it's crazy that you know we're still dealing with the same size MTUs. But a funny story along these lines with yeah. all of this, you know, whether it's label switching or overlay networks and everything. So back in 2013, I was at uh, what was at the time. Uh, LinuxCon in New Orleans, and I was at the Linux kernel, uh, the the plumbers summit there as well. And we were, a couple of us were talking about at the time, uh, you know, Lisp, whole separate thing. Let's not get into Lisp now, but and we were yeah. talking about NSH a bit, and we kind of presented like, oh, here's how we want to do this in the kernel with these with these new things. And we gave this presentation to this room full of kernel hackers, and they're all staring at us at the end. And Tom Herbert sitting at the front. And he looks and he says, at what point do you guys put so many headers on the packet that there's no room for actual data? <laughs> like the whole room started laughing. And I'm like, fair point. Fair point, you know. It's true. Yeah. Jumbo frames there, jumbo right? Frames, like right. that said, you can just jumbo frames, everything. It's all in the data center anyway. It's a big packet. It'll be fine. It'll get there, right? Well, I mean, and that's, I mean, if you use VPN anywhere, you, you run into this all the time. Um, that's, yeah, that, it, that it, is it, a, it's kind of amazing thing. that uh, like the internet even works. That patent G discovery is just the, this glue that makes it all. Oh, it's uh, yeah, it's yeah, kind of, kind of fascinating. <laughs> no, no kidding. Hey guys, we're we're kind of up on up against the time limit we set uh, for the for the chat. I think we'll probably have to take this as a part two or a, yep. or a part three or continue this on with the next one. But. Um, so I just wanted to wrap it up here. And uh, if you guys, do you guys have any closing remarks on on the evolution of SDN? And I guess we we didn't quite get past the big, the early days. So maybe the next one we'll do a more contemporary uh, talk about that. But but you know, what, what are your thoughts on the past? You know, what do, what have we learned? I Hopefully, think not to repeat we've... again. I think one thing that we've learned and that I think we definitely need to cover in a, in a future show is, is, is that ultimately, you know, standards are difficult without implementations, right? And this is the whole standards versus open source discussion, which I think we should cover in the future. But ultimately, if you look at that battle, like what, if you thought it was a battle, what won? Well, ultimately working code kind of trumps uh, other ideas that are, that are just kind of specs, right? So that, that's something interesting to look at. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, I, I think you know the the early days were fun, right? They were they were packed full of variety. And to Kyle's point, uh, can anybody like tell me how many SDN controllers there were by you know 2014? Right, <laughs> more for, yeah, more than they have digits. Um, I, I think. Oh, I that's... thought 2014 was the number of controllers. I'm sorry. But it, I it, it could game. have been. Oh, no, I, uh, <laughs> throw something Almost. out there. Almost right, but uh, you know that I, I think that that fragmentation is perhaps what hurts us early on, and that as <clears throat> on that open source and standards thing, we had a lot of network engineers and networking experts that were used to participation in forum, uh, like the IETF, uh, like IEEE, like all of these big standards bodies. But that does not necessarily mean that you're going to be good at doing open source, uh, which was very much the open stack approach. So I think that fragmentation hurt us very early on and might be why we're not quite as far along as we'd like to be. But we'll leave that for next time. Yeah, Brent? Yeah, I think 
So it's fun seeing kind of the rubber meet the road. You know, for the past decade, we, we in the early years, we were kind of throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, now we have kind of these orchestration systems that, that are finding massive adoption. And there is no choice but to start implementing some of these ideas around that, that SDN kind of has evolved into. So seeing the, the seeing the practical application of it is pretty amazing and seeing you know, what I'm always most excited about is seeing, you know, average network engineers uh, discovering, you know, this this vast new kind of world of, uh, you know, what it's like to, to work with systems and, and really become DevOps uh, engineers along with their along with their day job. So, yeah, and it's, it's great being here with, the, you know, I, over the years I learned from heroes and, and they're on this call. So uh, it's really cool being out there with you guys. <laughs> Yeah, it's it it, it uh, my my kind of comments are very similar to to what you guys said. I mean, I've I've loved working with you guys in the past, and have learned a lot of stuff from from you guys too. Um, in particular, in the open source thing, I mean, like Dave touched on this early, like the what I call the pre SDN stuff. I mean, I was heavily involved in not just working on standard stuff, but implementing them and. It was interesting at that time, it was when, when a few of us had recognized that there were organizations like the ITF, not to pick on those guys, but had rotated the other way completely from you know their mantra of you know running code uh, rough consensus to maybe rough consensus and run it, maybe some running code or something. And really open source really just ran over all of that. And um, it's what we have today. And what I'd like to explore um, as, as we go forward with having more of these, these sessions and, and talking about the different topics is, is actually how we learn from those, those mistakes. And today, uh, for example, these 5G VRAN things some of us are working on, uh, or CRAN, you know, containerized RAN even, um, how is this possible to make this actually work right? I mean, I think about this some days and go, you know, how are we going to do this? Because it, you know, we, we really need to learn from some of the things we didn't do. And, and some folks are trying to do re redo the mistakes that we had, for example, relying too heavily on standards. Um, and, you know, you know, the, like working through that stuff and talking about it, that that's really interesting from to me anyway. So I'm looking forward to that with you guys. So thanks, uh, you guys, and thanks, everybody, for listening, watching. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here for our first one, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody.